recording going. Okay. So I want to welcome you to um, a uh, Polar Week live event. We're very excited to be hosting this first event out of two this week um, in celebration of the Polar Week, um, connecting the poles to you wherever you may be. We have two presenters, two scientists with us today that are going to share uh, information about the polar regions with you. We have Megan Grabowski and Piotr Angeli. <laughs> Sorry about that. Today is March 20, 2012, and um, this event will be re will be archived and available online, and we'll send it back out to everybody that registered, as well as uh, Apex will also have access to it as well. So, with that, a few things that we want to uh, let you know about. So. What is Polar Week? Well, APEX, uh, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, um, decided to celebrate uh, the polar regions. If you were uh, participating in the International Polar Year in 2007 through 2009, um, you would know that there were several International Polar Days and weeks where um, we had webinars and lots of activities that took place during that week to help people recognize uh, the polar regions and what is happening. Uh, APEX decided that they liked that idea, and their education and outreach committee um, decided to pick up um, the Polar Week theme again. And this is their first one for this year. Um, it is all this week, March 18th through the 24th. There was an event yesterday. There's other activities happening around the world, and uh, we want to have you check out the APEX website, which is at the bottom of the slide, to find out what's going on. There's also a virtual balloon. Um, launching a website where you can place a marker that shows that you participated in a Polar Week event. And uh, so be sure to do that at the end of the day. They decided to pick this week because as we were just talking a little bit ago, it coincides with the spring equinox and we all have 12 hours of daylight this time of year. Uh, a few things about our platform that we're using. We're using Blackboard Collaborate, and uh, hopefully the slides have been changing for you, and the content will be showing up in the center of the screen. Um, there is a chat feature. Feel free to type your questions in the chat room to, to everybody. Um, if you have something specific you want to say to Sarah or myself, Janet, who are moderating this session, you can um, send it to us directly. Um, when it comes time to talk, it's important that you click on the talk button. Um, click on it once to open up your mic, and as soon as you're done talking, um, we need you to click on it again to close the mic um, so you won't get feedback, and then we can keep going. Uh, there's a list of participants. Um, at any time you have a question and you want to ask it live um, or, or near the end, Please click on the little hand icon above the list of participants, and that effectively raises your hand and lets us know that you have some questions. Uh, I don't think anybody's joining us by phone today, but if you are, star six to mute your phone and star six to unmute. Again, this event is being archived. Okay, next up. Um, if uh, we went over this a little bit, but if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box, and at the end we'll be taking live questions, and um, we'll come back to that. So we have um, we have a manageable group this time around. So we would like to hear from everybody. Have you introduced yourself? And if you have any others with you, whether they be students or adults, let us know. If your microphone is not working or you're having trouble with uh, the audio, you can type it in the chat box. So we'll go to uh, Bahavna Rao. Would you like to uh, say hello and click on the talk button? Okay, she's having some audio issues, so we'll have her uh, type in her information. Callie Stark. Nope, everybody's chatting instead. <laughs> okay, that works for us. So if uh, um, just say where you are and if you have anybody in there. So maybe that's um, no mic. Everybody's having some mic issues. Donna, if you'd like to introduce yourself, you're welcome to. <laughs> All right. Um, Mark Edwards. 
Can you hear us? I'm not sure if we have a ability to. Yeah, we heard you. Yeah. That was great. Thanks. Okay, welcome, Donna. Um, and then if uh, uh, Sophia Anderson would like to try, go ahead. Hi there, can you hear us? Yep, we can. Awesome, we're joining welcome. you from Tucson, Arizona. Oh, welcome. Okay, so good. I'm glad to have some students out there. That will make Megan and everybody else happy. Okay, so um, with that, we're going to start the presentation. So I know that uh, students do get antsy with these things. So today, um, our presenters that we're going to be connecting with to the polls with are Megan and and uh, Pietra, and uh, we are going to have them introduce themselves here in a moment. Um, the next um, person to talk will actually be Megan, so I'm going to be quiet here and let Megan talk a little bit about the polar regions. So Megan, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for this session. This is uh, pretty exciting stuff. So just a basic intro to the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Arctic is at the very top of the world, and the Antarctic is the opposite pole, so the uh, bottom of the world. And they have some things in common with regards to cold temperatures and ecosystems predominantly uh, based on ice. But they also have some different things. So we'll talk about those in the next slide. So the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, essentially, which means that many countries are involved in it. So each Arctic country uh, sort of has a say in their, in their bit of the Arctic. And this has led to the formation of things like the Arctic Council, which sort of uh, forms cooperation between these different countries. And uh, so another reason the Arctic is different from the Antarctic is it's a bit harder to define. So uh, some people define it by the Arctic Circle, which is 66 degrees. Um, some researchers look more at the tree line and uh, what is a above tree line in latitude is the Arctic. But um, yeah, basically that's a quick summary of, uh, of the Arctic. <laughs> so next is the Antarctic, which I'm sure Piotr will be able to tell you more about. I've never been to the Antarctic, but it uh, is essentially a landmass surrounded by ocean. Uh, so a bit easier to define. And instead of having um, each country uh, be able to have a say in, in its bit of it, because it's its own landmass, it's protected by the Antarctic Treaty, which um, many countries signed on to. And it is covered in ice most of the year. So it is a sort of a big ice sheet, although uh, same as the Arctic has trends with, with receding ice. So I'm sure Piotr will touch on that a bit more. Uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so that's that's me. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Yukon Territory, and uh, yeah, we can just go through the next few slides, and I'll talk about my background. So I'm uh, I'm 23 years old. I recently finished my university degree, and as I was attending university, doing my bachelor's, I had the opportunity to work in many different field locations in the summers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the different places that I worked there in the past few years around the Arctic. So as I said, I'm from the Yukon Territory. I was born in Dawson City, uh, which is in the top left corner. There's my mom pushing me down the board rock. Um, Dawson City is well known for the gold rush of 1898. <laughs> for anyone that knows about that. Uh, and then Whitehorse is to the right of that. Um, so Whitehorse is the capital of the Yukon. There's about 25,000 people. And uh, yeah, so I went to high school there. Um, and as I was growing up, I enjoyed many outdoor pursuits, uh, such as snowshoeing. There's my snowshoes in the bottom there. And uh, yeah, Jack London, exactly. <laughs> and um, on the bottom right, uh, 
I enjoy hunting and fishing. So last uh, fall, I, I got my first doll sheep, which is a pretty proud moment for, for me. My dad took me out hunting for seven days. It was a tough trip, but uh, yeah, I had a freezer with meat for the winter. So that was pretty awesome. So yeah, I attended high school, started university, and then uh, got involved in field research just through um, a supervisor named Isla Myers-Smith. She had a poster up in the university I was attending, and I asked if I could go, and, and she took me along. So I went to Pika Camp, which is in the southwest of Yukon. They used to study pikas there, and so that's thus the name. Pikas are just a small alpine uh, sort of, actually, not sort of a small mammal thing. But uh, when I was there, I was studying the willows, so bottom left corner, and studying whether willows are moving up uh, in latitude and up in elevation based on warming temperatures and thawing permafrost. So it was a fly-in helicopter in camp, my first time in a helicopter, which was very exciting. We went in early June, uh, so our tents are set up on the snow, and we stayed until, uh, actually the rest of them stayed until end of September. I had to go back to school, but uh, yeah, other people in the camp were studying active ground squirrels. It was uh, remote and uh, just about 12 to 15 people from England, Australia, the U.S. and Canada. So my first big field experience and very, very positive. So that led me to go to another camp. The next summer it was just me and a master's student living in a cabin on Hudson Bay Mountain outside of Smithers, B.C. So not really Arctic, but, but still a valuable field experience. Uh, we were studying horned larks, so a small songbird, uh, observing their nest behaviors by snowshoeing around, finding nests, monitoring them through through the summer, uh, banding the adult birds and the chicks, so that next year when they go back, they can tell which pairs are returning and that kind of thing. Um, so again, remote camp, um, and made made a really good friend out of it. So immediately after working here, I went to Svalbard. The uh, university center on Svalbard is a small school, basically, for university students to go on exchange. So my class was half Norwegian and half international. And Svalbard, I guess I should explain, um, is a group of islands, yeah, half, exactly, halfway between Norway and the North Pole. Uh, it's a small Norwegian town that I was living in, about 2,000 people, called Longyearbyen, on the main island, Spitsbergen. And I arrived in late July and stayed till December. So I got to study, as you can see in the top left, uh, the Arctic vegetation in the summer. And then in the middle there, um, I got to study in the winter, which was a whole different beast with the cold temperatures and the wind. And I was, I was basically just a, a polar bear guard for a, for a PhD student as he was, as he was doing his research. Yeah, there are there are definitely polar bears on Svalbard. I I was very fortunate in that um, any interactions I had were very benign. I saw one from a boat and I saw one across the fjord, so <laughs> it was okay. But you are required to carry a, a a rifle when you leave the town site, so I was I was basically the the one at the ready. Should we have seen one during that winter research? which in the polar night was a bit a bit stressful, but a good experience nonetheless. And so yeah, different wildlife there. So on the bottom there's a Svalbard reindeer. Just a whole different set of wildlife because Svalbard is so isolated. So it was a real pleasure for me to see all that. So um, Svalbard is at 78 degrees north. And after going to Svalbard, I really wanted to check out other sites at that latitude. So I applied to work at Alexander Fjord Field Camp on Ellesmere Island, which is the northernmost island in North America. It's kind of beside Greenland. So I was working on this fjord um, from beginning of June to uh, the later part of August, just last summer. There was um, about five of us for three months. We landed on the sea ice. Uh, in a twin otter plane at the beginning of June, and we were there until until the end of August when we flew out on a plane with the plane had wheels at that point. <laughs> but we were studying mostly vegetation, although in the early season, in the morning, we'd have to get up and count and count the seals on the sea ice. 
which was pretty cool, although they're hard to see. Uh, and then as the snow melted, we studied the plants and the insects and the other wildlife. There was an arctic fox den nearby that we monitored. And then later in the year before we left, we studied uh, things like glacier retreat and the plant senescence, like what rate the plants were, were sort of um, going to seed and, and wilting. So that was a pretty incredible experience. Uh, I feel really fortunate to have been there. So the m main thing I want to pass on about my experience at field camps is that, yes, I, I had the opportunity to contribute to a body of Arctic research, um, which, is, which is fantastic. And I hope to do more, but also that I got to meet some really incredible people and uh, make some really great connections and see beautiful locations that I, I wouldn't have had the chance to otherwise if I hadn't been doing field research. So what's next for me? Well, I finished my degree at UBC, University of British Columbia in Vancouver last spring. And this winter I've been working for Wildlife Conservation Society, which is an NGO, um, and I was based in Whitehorse, so got to work in my hometown, which was nice. And I started... Um, getting really into competitive dog mushing. So you know, when I think about what's next, I hope to do more of that. The picture is me in a dog race last month um, as part of Rendezvous, which is an event in February in the winter. Um, so I'm presenting the work that I did with Wildlife Conservation Society uh, at the uh, IPY conference in Montreal next month. And oh, what do I see there? Fairbanks on the Quest. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'd love to come to Fairbanks on the Quest. The Quest is a bit long, though. <laughs> I was only doing sprint dog mushing, so about 10 miles. So <laughs> it would be an adjustment to do the Quest, but I would love to. <laughs> um, so after the, oh, at the conference, I'm hoping to chat with people about doing a master's, hopefully based around the Arctic at, at maybe University of Victoria or McGill. And then after that, I'm actually traveling to New Zealand to visit a friend that I made on Svalbard. So I uh, take a bit of time to travel before I start a master's. So yeah, anyways, that's, that's about it for me. So I'll pass it over to Piotr. OK, and uh, thank you, Megan. Um, again, if you have questions as we go along, you'll be able to ask them at the end. But um, if you have questions uh, right now, feel free to type them in there. Um, too. Okay. <laughs> You're getting an applause by Donna's group and students. All right. Our next presenter. Go ahead, uh, Piotr. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Piotr Angel. I am from Poland. And as you can see, I am PhD candidate at, West, at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And I have two master degrees, one in geography and second in, in geology. And as you will hear, I spent quite a lot of time in, in Antarctica and uh, in other polar regions. But how, how, how this started? So my parents both are geographers, actually. Both are PhDs in, ge in geography. And I was exposed to science from, from the very beginning. And first time, I was fascinated with the polar regions when my father went to Svalbard so the same island as, as Megan went, uh, for three summers in a row when I was six, six to eight years old. And that was the first time I saw his pictures of polar bears. I saw first glaciers and I was just so, so fascinated. I, I really loved it. And I was fortunate to start my, my study at Warsaw University in, in Poland. And I went to Iceland. So maybe we can switch to the next slide. And here is Iceland, and here is Vatnajökull. This is the biggest uh, glacier in, in Europe, which is, which is really huge. It's 150 kilometers long by 80 kilometers. And this is just a small tongue coming out from the, from the huge plateau. And with my friends, we went to, to a Nunatak, which is, which is a rocky island inside this glacier, to study changes of this glacier inside this glacier, not on the front, just, just to see it inside. And it was an amazing trip because we, we, we walked 20 kilometers on ice and then spent one week in a small hut surrounded by ice. And 
we saw huge, huge changes in we, we knew where the glacier was 100 years ago, and today we can see that this, is, this glacier is 100 meter, meter thinner than 1,000 years ago. So this was a, a huge, huge change. So now next slide. And after, after Iceland, I got a job offer as a researcher in Antarctica, and that was a, an amazing adventure for sure. First. First, we started from Virginia. You can see it in on on the map on the right on the right corner there, right here. And I went to Antarctica on on a boat. So we we spent 35 days cruising across Atlantic, changing the all climate zones, and then we went down to King George Island. And this is very interesting, uh, very interesting area. This is just on the tip of Antarctic Peninsula, and this is area of very dynamic climate and and the climate is not that cold as in inside the continent. So temperature actually quite often oscillates around around zero, around melting point. So this is the area where global climate changes are very, very visible. And we can see it on the next slide. Uh, because I spent there fifteen months and here here I was doing many, many things and one of them was monitoring of glaciers and here you can see how how this glacier changed before my eyes. It was unbelievable how, how fast this glacier was, was retreating. So it's it went, if I remember correctly, twenty meters in back in one in one year. And this is and this is the, the effect of temperature increase just of zero point three Celsius by ten years. So one Celsius degree in, in 30 years, which, which seems it's not too much, but here where, where freezing point is quite often crossed by temperature, it's, it's, this, this change is, 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 is very big. And on the next slide, you can see a bigger picture of these changes. This is what the White Eagle Glacier, and you can see how much this glacier retreated since, since 100 years ago. And this is again about four or five kilometers. And here I was studying uh, glacier landforms and plant colonization on, on this on this glacier forest field. And here I was I was also surprised how fast is this colonization because I I went to to the are, to areas very close to the glacier front and the first plants were just twenty five meters from the from the front. So one year ago, two years ago, this this place was was ice covered, and now first plants are starting to grow there. Of course, the further from the glacier, the more vegetation you have. So on these moraines, they are highlighted. They are they are from 1956. These these moraines are covered in 75 percent by by lichens, by by grass. So that's 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 really fast. <coughs> okay, on the next slide, you. You you will see my next project, and this was my second stay in Antarctica. I went, I went the second time. I went for for half a year just to do penguin monitoring, and and why 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 this is important, and why why this is in, in, this is connected to to climate. So these penguins they are they are nesting on on King George Island. There are three different species of penguins: gentle penguins. You can see it on on, the, on this picture. Adeli penguins and chinstrap penguins, they, they eat almost exclusively Antarctic krill, this, this small creature you can see on the top picture. And 80-100% of, of, the, of their diet is, is, this, is this animal. And krill is very sensitive to sea ice extent change. And this is because the they larvae eat plankton overgrowing sea ice. So it's easier to see penguin population changes than try to catch this krill around Antarctica on very stormy water water. So so this this is this is one, one way to see how much uh, climate change can influence penguin population. And we see long term decrease in, in penguin populations, for example in Adeli penguins, which drops by seventy percent. This is because of of krill abundance decreasement. And to, to see these changes, of course, you need to 
to study these breeding populations every year. So, so we started this monitoring, and now every year, some some people have to go there and study penguins to to, to recognize how how big are are these changes. And in the last slide, I would like to summarize. So why this all is important? Why why this is important? So first of all, I, I, it's important to record present day status to see what has changed, and also to record what what's today. What, where is where is the glacier? Where are plants? Where are, where are penguins? How 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 are the populations doing? And this this illustrates how fast are are changes due to climate change and how fast is response. To, to climate warming by plants and by by animals. <coughs> so, also, this is this is the great thing what what I'm doing right now. So, as a scientist, this is the best way to to say what are we doing because my role is also to communicate my my research results and communicate these changes to to others to to you because we we all share the responsibility for for our planet. And uh, yes, I, I would like to thank you for, for, your, for your invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. That was great. Yeah. So uh, you both have very interesting lives <laughs> and gone to some very fascinating places. So we are ready to um, go back to questions. And uh, just a reminder, if you want to ask your question live, which is, uh, this is a great time to talk to um, both of our presenters, both scientists, and ask your own question, um, click on the little hand icon at the top of the list, and then we can call on you, and um, you can ask your question through um, the mic. So um, if you don't want to do that, then you can also type it in the, in the chat box. Some of you have. So, so Megan, a question for you from Mark. How did you get involved with the inter internship from WCS? That's a that's a great question because I was I was right out of my bachelor's, so it's um, I don't think it's a very common thing. But I uh, I basically expressed an interest with with that my initial contact um, who got me that first job at Pika Camp that I was looking for science related work but based in Whitehorse. And so she put me in contact with a a person named Donald Reed who worked for WCS in Whitehorse. And we together applied for a grant from the Yukon College, which was then um, my wages, and we just used data that was collected during IPY that hadn't been analyzed yet. So I didn't have to do any field work. I just took existing data sets and um, sort of worked on that and wrote a paper with that. So it sort of happened in a few different ways. But uh, it was definitely a great experience. And I would recommend doing um, sort of internship work before diving into a master's. I've, that's been really beneficial for me. OK. Thank you. Um, yeah, that sounds like there are in the United States there are some similar types of programs called research experiences for undergraduates. So if you end up going to um, a college in the United States, um, they do have um, undergraduate programs and field experiences for undergraduates that um, around the world. It doesn't have to be polar regions, but there are some really good ones. Um, okay, so um, we have another question. How long, um, and I don't know if this is directed to which researcher, but how long is your research, uh, this research going on? So we'll start with Megan, and then we'll move on to uh, Piotr. I'm not, I'm not sure um, which, which research um, you're referring to, but in general, um, the, the field camps I've worked at um, for example, Pika Camp has been going on since the early to mid 90s, but different projects. And then uh, Alexander Fjord has been going on since the early 90s. Um, so a couple long-term monitoring sites there. But usually, when I work with masters or PhD students, it's about two to five years. Mm. Okay, and Pierre. All right. So I will try to answer both questions. So I was. I was doing my, my research for 
Polish Academy of Science, and Poland has uh, Antarctic Station on Kinzerg Island. It's a year-round station, and this is found by Polish government. And this research started in '79, and and every year we are doing this monitoring. Every year we are looking at glaciers uh, retreat, and we count penguins. So this is a big long project. Thank you. Okay, and uh, did you answer that second part about who funded it? Yes, I did. Polish government. Okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're changing the picture over here. We can't keep up. Um, and um, well, if there's anybody else that wants to ask a question live, looks like Donna is typing. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have Donna's question. What kind of employment opportunities are there and what are the average salaries for polar researchers? All right, since um, so we'll go back to Megan. I want you to tell them what you know so far. Yeah, so I, I'm just starting out in my career, thus my involvement with APEX. So I'm not I'm not really a hundred percent sure what's out there. I mean, um if it depends what facet you want to work in. I think um, if you want to do a master's, you're usually funded enough to do your work and, and, and live reasonably. And then <laughs> same with a PhD, maybe a bit more when you do your PhD, depending where. I mean, Norway, for instance, makes, would make a lot more doing academic work than, than you would in Canada, maybe. But beyond that, uh, it depends if you want to work in industry, government, or, or for a, a non-government organization. Um, but I, I think there's plenty of opportunities, especially right now um, after the International Polar Year. I think a lot of information was put out about the importance of, of working in the Arctic. And uh, yeah, there's certainly opportunities available. OK, uh, Pierre Pierre? Uh, all right, so in, in Poland, there are not many opportunities to, to work uh, in polar regions because we have just two stations, one on Svalbard and one in Antarctica, and there they are limited sources for resources for, for funding. But uh, there is always chance to be involved, for example, as a, as a volunteer. So there, is, there are great uh, programs for, for volunteers. So you can hug penguin like, like I do on this picture. There, is, there, are, there are open positions for volunteers for monitoring. And average salaries, I, I think they are, comparing to average, they are a little bit uh, higher because you are going to remote areas and this is kind of reward for, for that. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting about polar research and polar science is that um, a lot of programs are not taking place, like you could be part of a university in Florida, they have an Arctic science program, or there's, you know, around the world universities, um, there was one, a group yesterday we were talking to from Portugal that has, does a lot of uh, polar research. And so it's not in the, in the places that you think it would be. So polar scientists seem to be everywhere. They live everywhere <laughs> around the world and uh, do, um, um, and then commute basically to the polar region. So there's lots of opportunities out there. Um, so they may be in your own backyard. You just have to look. I have a question. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about when I was in school and learning science, and I'm wondering if you both um, enjoyed learning science when you were a kid, or what was your favorite part of science class when you were in school? Maybe we can start with uh, Megan. I, uh, I would say my, my most positive school experience that led me to, to do research w was outdoor education programs. So for example, when I was in eighth grade, um, we got to do this canoe trip down the Queston River in, in the Yukon. It was 10 days and we saw moose and, and beavers and all kinds of wildlife and, and we really started asking questions about why, you know, moose feed in the marshy areas, like why we were canoeing around there and seeing them there. Or, or just, yeah, got really um, 
inspired to ask questions. So I'd say outdoor education was key in getting me interested in outdoor ecology. Thanks. What about you there? Pieter, do you have a response to that? Uh, in, in one second, I, I will just ask, answer first the, the first question. So, in my in my case, also the this kind of uh, outdoor education was was my favorite. And as I mentioned before, my parents they, they are geographers. So every every weekend we went to to nature to see some birds, to see some plants, to to go to the wild, and that was that was something which I which I was looking always forward. So so then then I. When I started my, my master's, I was also very active to travel a lot to do some research in, in, in other areas. And, and I went to Gobi Desert, I went to Sahara Desert to do some field work there. And, and then I got fascinated with polar regions. So, yeah, so that, that, was, that, was, that was it. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, while you're talking there, um, there were two questions that came up, so we'll just have you respond to them. What do you eat when you're in the Arctic and the Antarctic? And then there's a question directly for you from a fourth grader. With global warming and the evidence of the receding glacier, have you noticed a temperature change in the time you have been in the Antarctic? All right, so let me start with first question, what do I eat? So. My my field work was in in a small hut and it was it was far away from from station so so everything what you can keep frozen keep what you can keep dry dry food uh, every every kind of this kind of food so camping food <laughs> you could you could say but it's it's quite tough when you when you do field work for half a year and you you have to eat only canned food. That's not not the healthiest way, but that there is no other choice. And with other thing with uh, with supply when when I when I was working in Antarctic, the 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 the, the whole supply from to my station was from Poland. So on the ship I was going to Antarctica was also our food. So after after a while, of course, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables were gone after maybe one two months, and we were there for 15 months. So. So then we had frozen food. We had uh, we had some frozen meat, frozen fish, and this kind of this kind of food, and that was that was our food. Okay, yeah, and, and of course we need we need more calories for for to do field work, and and you are you would be surprised how much how much you can really eat because of this cold. It's it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and now let me try to answer the second question. So. Uh, of course, there is there is evidence uh, of global war warming with with glacier retreat, but it's very very difficult to 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 see it or to feel it uh, in one to one year because there are there are some years they are a little bit warmer, there are some years they are a little bit uh, colder, and and you can you cannot tell where you are. You have to see a long trend, long let's say 30 years trend, and this temperature will go up and down, up and down, up and down, and 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 if you if you make an average and if, if you connect connect these points, you will see that this temperature is, is is rising. Okay, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. How about uh, we'll go to Megan real quickly and talk about the food that she got to eat and what it's like to be in camp life. That's a great question because it's something that I didn't think about going in. But uh, so it depends on on the camps I've been in. Some were more remote than others. In Pika Camp, we we flew in all our food at the beginning, and then we um, we hiked in food later. For example, we would get friends to visit and hike in flour for <laughs> more bread. <laughs> but uh, I, so it it depends on what what your camp will allow as well. At, at, at Pikey Camp, we we brainstormed because we were really craving something fresh. So we brainstormed how this could happen, and we put it by our supervisor to drop in some food from a plane, which seemed like a great idea <laughs> at the time. Uh, until the food got dropped, uh, we go out to find it in in the valley and. 
many things have exploded. So, for example, um, if we tried to drop a container of salsa and there was salsa splattered on the tundra, and a box of granola bars sort of scattered on a shrub, so <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the best idea. <laughs> um, last summer at Alex Fjord, we got resupplied with groceries once a month about, mostly canned goods or, or root vegetables kind of thing, and made do with with cabbage and, and things like that. Not a, not a whole lot of fresh things, but, um, but definitely led to a lot of creative lentil recipes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have you there. There's a question um, from uh, Bahamas uh, group. Uh, what do you wear to protect yourself from the cold when you are either in the Arctic or the Antarctic? And so I can well, go with that if you want. Yes. Um. So the. It's basically I wear a lot of layers, so pretty much long johns constantly. Um, even in the summer on Svalbard and Ellesmere Island, uh, long johns are your friend. <laughs> and then a mid layer, like a fleece or something, like fleece pants, fleece jackets, and then and then a down jacket is pretty standard, or a rain jacket. I mean, yeah, it's just layers and things you can take on and off in case you're hiking around. I'd say uh, my down jacket was probably my best friend in these places. Thanks. Okay, Pieter. All right. So I, I, I had exactly the same the same equipment. I would like just to add that uh, the most important is not to get sweat when you are hiking when you are doing your work because then you start to to lose your warmth and that's that's the most important. So that's why many layers. Good, good uh, breathing materials, which are keeping moisture away away from your body, and and also no rash when you work. You just need to be careful about that. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, another question that we wanted to uh, ask both of you is, what about being a scientist that you really like? I know you talked about being outside and being exposed very early on, but what is it about science itself that uh, you like? So we'll go with uh, Pieter. All right. So what what I love about science is that uh, I'm independent some, somehow pro with my projects, and I can always adjust them to to this what I see in the in the field and. There are so many things that are changing, and if you are going to the field, you you just see that you can observe more than you previously thought, and this is this is just so great that you you have so many opportunities, and every time you are coming back, you are richer, you know more, and and this is this is this learning process which I which I really love. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Megan, how about you? Uh, I think I think science is is amazing because you have the opportunity to answer those different things you've always been curious about, um, and especially in the Arctic, as things are rapidly changing, um, it's it's just a, it's just an opportunity to be a part of this and and learn about how communities can understand and adapt to to the upcoming changes and current changes really. Um, so yeah, it's basically a chance to to answer inherent human curiosity, which uh, is really great. Thanks for the awesome question. You're welcome. All right, so we have uh, some questions from Sveha's uh, group of students. They want to know about the animals that you've encountered and if you've had any dangerous experiences. So let's start with animals. Go ahead, um, Megan. I've been I've been really lucky in that all my wildlife encounters have been really positive, but I think that's also because at the camps I've worked at we've been aware of of who's around and and prepared like we have plans in case anything should happen so so we're kind of uh, alert which I think is key. Um, I, I mean the the chief concern in the Arctic is polar bear encounters. 
but I think as long as you are aware of the dangers and, and prepared that that it's just kind of a chance a chance you have to take. Um, I'm used to growing up with, with grizzly bears camping, so it's not a really big adjustment, just a different kind of bear. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess there was a, uh, there's also Arctic, an Arctic wolf hanging around my camp at Alex Fjord, but didn't, didn't present any dangers, but was an incredible creature to see up close. Um, it, you know, would kind of hang around and just check us out, and, and to be that close to, uh, to, you know, a big white wolf was, it was pretty much one of the best things. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't say it was uh, necessarily dangerous in any way, but more more an incredible experience. Okay, great. Piotr? All right, so I will address how it's in the, in the south, in Antarctica. So Antarctica is quite quite unique because animals on the land, they have, they have no natural enemies. So this is this is very unique because you can come very close to penguins, you can come very close to seals, and they are not afraid of you. They are, maybe they, they can be aggressive because there is time of the courtship or, for example, for elephant seals, which are, I think these are the most dangerous. They are, they are very big. Males are about four tons and they can be four meters long. And they, they try to protect their females they have a big harems of, of females, and if they see you, they can think, oh, you are another male trying to sneak and steal my females. So that's, uh, that's, that's dangerous. And the second part of the question, if I had any dangerous experience from, from, from my field work, I had a I had couple very scary moments because to access these field sites which I was working on, I, I, I was using Zodiac, and with my friends we were we were going to to the sites crossing sea. And a couple times uh, weather changed really really fast, and we were trapped by storm on the on the on the bay or on the open ocean. And it was very very scary because once once we got boat full of water and 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 I got my legs partially frozen, and that was. That was a very scary experience. Luckily, nothing, nothing bad happened. But, but you have to be really, really careful. Thank you. All right, great answer. So we have another question, and we'll probably just take a few more before we sign off here. Um, one of my students would like to know what we can do to raise awareness of the changes in the glaciers. So, Piotr, well, this is probably for you. All right. I think I think the the most important is to realize that this is not just happening somewhere in the south or somewhere in the north where we cannot see it. It's actually it can it can affect everybody because of these glacial changes. Sea level can can rise and and it's it's actually rising. So some some countries in for example in Polynesia, which are very Small islands, very low elevated, couple meters above sea level. They are really afraid what what the future will bring for them, and and they are trying to to adjust. So I think I think by by realizing that these changes are actually affecting people, that's that, that's that's the most important. Thank you. Okay, great. Megan, do you want to add anything to that? I think it's worth mentioning that um, one of the best ways to wear to one of the best ways to raise awareness about about any issue you care about is just sharing it with family and friends. I mean, part of the reason I've enjoyed participating in research is I've gotten to to talk to my family and my friends about all these things and sort of share. Every time I get back from field camp, they want to know how it was and and how it went and what we were talking about. And so just that. That sort of interpersonal connection has been a really good reward for me. All right, and it looks like uh, um, we just had a resource that was shared, Many Strong Voices um, dot org, that uh, Sarah posted. Which seems like I don't know. You want to comment on it? Yeah, it's just uh, a, an organization that 
helps bring together the people of the Arctic and those small island nations that uh, Piotr was talking about and how they meet those challenges of climate change. Even though they're so far apart on the globe and you are probably somewhere between those places, wherever you are in your classrooms, it tells the stories of people who are around the world and, and adapting to change. All right. Um, anybody else have any last questions? Well, you're getting some thank yous there. So I think um, we will wrap this up. So um, again, thank you, Megan and Pieter, for uh, your um, for presenting today as part of Polar Week. And it's very interesting to hear what you two have been doing as young scientists. It sounds like you'll be cruising have a good career ahead of you. Um, we want to thank APEX, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, for um, putting on this uh, presentation and, and uh, Polar Week for us all um, so we have an opportunity to learn more about the polls. And we do encourage you to uh, join us again later this week. We have another um, webinar on Thursday. And you can check out the Polar Trek website as well as the APEX website for the time for your time zone and register for that event as well as the presenters. Um, and again, we, thanks to uh, Megan Pieter and all of you for joining us today. And we'll post the archives soon. And have a great week. Thank you.